Welcome to the Jess Larson Show, where I interview innovators and leaders. Today on the show, we've got repeat guest, Pete Newell. Pete, thanks for doing this. Glad to be here. So, uh, retired Army Colonel, CEO of BM&T, helping out with the nonprofit space, doing stuff with Stanford. Uh, g- give, us the, give us the quick overview of what, what your day, day in the life looks like for Pete these days. Oh, my goodness. Um, so, I'm a, I'm a reformed retired Colonel. Um, to, who took out all of his anger on, you know, of, of, of being constantly sent to combat with the wrong formation, wrong training, wrong equipment, and having to make do. Um, so, so literally, I spent the last seven, eight years trying to figure out how to harness the entrepreneurial spirit of, of not just Silicon Valley, but the rest of the country, you know, and turn that to doing good things for, um, our national security um, platforms, whether it's DOD or Homeland Security or or whoever else. I, I think in the process of doing that, I realized the real issue was not necessarily that, that people didn't want to work in the national security spaces. They just, they couldn't. They're actually repelled by um, the far and by um, the difficulty it was in actually working with government partners. It's not because the government people were bad. It's just because the two systems are completely um, polar opposite from one another. So I, the past eight years have really been dedicated to first learning uh, what the real problems were, and then you know, two, starting to build the responses to them. And you know, quite frankly, BM and T is a response to a problem. Um, hacking for defense, one of the programs we launched was a response to a problem. Some of the stuff Steve Blank has done, the Gordian Knight Center at Stanford was a response to a problem. But if you look at our relationship over the seven years, it really, we have continued to find problems, build groups of people, and build responses to those problems, whether it was a company, a nonprofit, a program, or, or something else. That's what life is. And just for people who didn't hear the last time you were on the show, can you tell people what BM, BMNT does? So BMNT is both a, a consulting company that focuses on innovation and entrepreneurship management inside large uh, enterprise level organizations uh, and a early stage tech accelerator that helps emerging companies and teams and people uh, who have technologies that, that have a solid basis for uh, commercial use, but also uh, a defense or national security application. We help them get started, get formed, and turn into um, both successful companies and companies that can actually work with the government. And because we do those two things, um, we are we're involved in uh, a fund that provides uh, private equity or private capital investment in, in certain companies. Uh, and we have uh, you know, our own program, the Venture Studio, that actually spins out things. So I talk about hacking for defense as a spin out of BMT. The Common Mission Project, which is the nonprofit that runs the academic programming for H4D, the Hacking for Homeland Security, and a bunch of climate programming now is a spin out of BMT. And here in about two weeks, I have an AI company that we're going to spin out. So we'll talk about that one next time. You know, before we started the show, I was telling you kind of our, our new focus lately on the show is kind of this idea of we want to talk to all kinds of different experts from different backgrounds and say, what can we learn from their successes that apply to somebody who's trying to trying to build a company over a billion dollar valuation? And yeah. a lot of times people like that, you know, they get people roll their eyes. They're like, yeah, Steve Blank can build his last company and sell it for eight billion, but you're not Steve Blank, you know, right? And there's there's a lot of skepticism. And you you brought up that People ask you, like, well, does BMT make any money? And like, and you're like, yeah, we've had $100 million in the last seven years, right? Um, uh, and then, then you'd be amazed at how many times I get that question. And I look at them. It, yeah, it's one of two things. This one is, I'm going to leave government service. And I'm going to do what you do. It, and I just, you know, I roll my eyes. It's like, do you have any idea how hard this is to build a, a revenue driven company, which means there's no venture dollars in it? You know, we had simply built a company based on what we made, but but actually to earn a hundred million dollars in that process. So, so in many cases, we've earned more money than most of those companies out there 
have gained in venture capital funding. Yeah, and I think it stuns people when you tell them that, that that's what we did. Now, I'll tell you, that's insanely hard to do. It's just insanely hard. Um, I, I laugh at the Steve Blank thing, and, and Steve will tell you the same thing. It's just when people forget that, that he failed at five companies before he had two that did okay and one that got sold for a billion dollars. So one that's, when you look at people who say, I'm going to do this, and the first thing you say is, well, it'd be hard. You'll never get there. It's like, go. Um, because even if you fail, you're going to learn the skills that will make you successful down the road. And that is significantly different than, than most people experience in those conversations. So talking about that, when you think about, um, you think about the, the space you're in, you know, we, we've had a lot of guys on the show, you know, come out of, uh, coming out of special operations community, even some, you know, guys coming out of uh, the classified levels of special operations. You know, these, these are exceptional people. Many of them become entrepreneurs and, uh, you know, we, we've had guys on the show like, like Al Buford, who, who, you know, kind of have, have reached that kind of hundred million dollar a year revenue, but most of the other guys haven't. Right. And when you think about what you've done differently, what do you, what do you attribute some of the success to that maybe isn't as obvious on the surface? Yeah. One is, I think that having a, a really good understanding of the level of risk you're willing to take. Then I don't say I haven't made mistakes. And, and I say this, you know, we started the, the company with four people on a driveway, four partners. And um, I fired one of the partners three months later. And I've done that a couple of times where, you know, I really had substantial people as part of the company. They just want the former. It's like done, can't, can't afford to be distracted or to be drugged back by, by something like that. So I, I think that's one is, is really being able to step back and focus on, you know, what your mission is and you know, being able to depersonalize, you know, success and failure and other things. Um, the other is being able to personally accept the risk. I have this conversation with, with virtually everybody who's leaving the military that wants to talk about you know, the next job. And the first thing I ask them is, you know, are you financially stable? Is your family stable? Um, are you rooted to the ground someplace? Because the kids are in high school and you're in the home. And, and quite frankly is, do you need a job because you have to work to, to pay the bills? Or, or are you looking for something that will teach you something that will make you something so later on? And, and, and if you're on the first crowd, it, it's not a bad thing. It's just, Entrepreneurship is probably not going to be your game, at least until you get to the point you can. But if if you have the ability to keep yourself afloat and dedicate that time, then then you may survive to actually get something done. Um, the other is assuming that what somebody starts is what they'll actually end up doing. Um, we're we're hit, and I'll say this: I'm I'm going to out my own company. We're about to roll into what we call BMT 3.0. And literally, we will launch the third version of this company in, in, in seven years. And each one of them has been driven by some substantial learning that we had over the first year. Um, you might recognize, you know, people from earlier days at BMT might recognize some of the same things that were back seven years ago. But it's night and day different. We do different things. We're focused on different things. I mean... I think it's it's helping people understand that you can't take a snapshot of day one and, and think that you're going to understand where somebody's going to be when they when they're three years into it. It's a journey, and the goal is to get the first step taken and then um, bolt as many advisors and other people to give you honest feedback that allows you to move along that pathway. So when you decide to evolve instead of holding on to what you had to become what you can become. Um, What's that decision tree like when you're saying like, nope, it's time to become the MNT 3.0? Um, I, I will tell you when we went from 1.0 to 2.0, and I have a picture of the meeting where I said it because the body language of the room is like, you know, there were 12 people in the company. All of them pushed back from the table, literally, arms crossed, um, a couple of eye rolls. The tape was just so bad, I literally had to fire a guy the next day. He was so angry at, at the change. And 2.0 was the, we're going from being 
consultants are doing other things to really focusing on hacking for defense of uh, this process issue. If people said, wait, well, we're, we're now management consultants. And quite frankly, the answer is yes, we are. You know, we're a different kind of management consultant, but that's what we're going to do. And, you know, so the record's clear, both in terms of we're hacking for defense event versus we're um, BM&T's enterprise level work inside organizations. Have done. So it was the right move to make, but um, I tell people when, when you talk about doing a pivot, if nobody's throwing up in the corner, it wasn't a pivot. So one one second there. There's a couple of things I want to touch on. First, uh, H4D, Hacking for Defense, you guys have that at over 50 universities now, is that right? Hacking for Defense in the United States is in over 50. Hacking for Defense uh, hacking for the Ministry of Defense in the UK, I think, is in twelve, and then hacking for national security in Australia is in seven this year. So really, I'm close to seventy universities across three three countries. We've also spun out um, hacking for Homeland Security, which is running uh, programming for FEMA the Transportation Security Administration and the Cybersecurity um, Infrastructure, Cyber Infrastructure Security Agency, as well as um, about a dozen climate-based programs that are focused on um, climate issues, community resiliency, and other things. And I think there's at least one local policing program and one health program in the UK as well. So if, if I rolled it all out and said um, the model for hacking for probably well over 80 universities between the US, Australia, and the UK. When you think about getting something to catch on that much, getting that many different organizations, I mean, we we talked before about the bureaucracy of trying to do business with the government. And I, I yeah. couldn't believe nope. there was that many forms, right? When we were doing leadership training for different special operations groups and stuff. Um, but I mean, universities, the bureaucracy is just as bad or worse in certain places, That's, ooh, right? Uh, yes. When you think about making making something of the quality that you made to get adopted so many different places, or well, what principle do you have? from that success that would apply to other folks in other businesses? So, so I will, I'll credit Alex Osterwalder for, um, I, I don't want to say the principle, this process of discovery, you know, the early conversations between Alex and Steve and I was the, the takeaway on value propositions. And normally, you know, in customer discovery, you talk about the value proposition for a single customer and understand the pain, the gains. Um, in, in the national security space, we're actually, in, in particular H13, we're talking about four. Um, there is one where the students are looking for an opportunity to not just learn, but to gain experience in the university that actually helps them get a job. And their demands on the university are increasing in, in that realm. Um, the military or the national security folks want to get their problems that they can't get to into the hands of really bright people. And they want to get essentially the world's best market research into was my problem right? What the tech, what the ecosystem, what's the, um, and I'll tell you, those students that go through the program produce the world's best market research you could ever get your hands on. Um, um, Industry wants the students. They want students who have this kind of experience to come work for their countries. And it's, it's not a, I think I can say it, it's not an accident that Lockheed Martin, you know, has supported the Common Mission Project in H4D with, with almost a million dollars over the last, you know, three years. Um, and then finally, the universities are under intense pressure to produce something other than just learning and research. They're actually under pressure to prove things that are applied, both in terms of students and other things. So um, hacking for defense is a very nuanced balance of meeting all four of those value propositions at the same time. And, and the thing you have to be careful about is if you overreact to one, you pull the others out of balance, and those other partners quit and walk away. And, and that's not what you want. So, so it, takes, it takes a lot of effort and a lot of time to build a set of rules 
that that people will play by and agree to um, that that actually services all four of those. It is nice to have so many interested groups be able to get benefit, right? It's amazing that they play so well together. And in the early days, they, you know, there were, you know, first it was Stanford University wanted to say, well, we own it. Um, and we had to disavow with that. And then it was somebody at the university level who claimed that the class was going beyond basic research and had all kinds of ITAR problems. And then it was somebody else that claimed um, that, that everything we did would go straight to the signees. And then there was, it was just one thing after another over time that we've had to pick off and deal with. But but once we've solved those issues for people and, and there's something written, the standard operating procedure, here's the answer to that issue, it really has worked well. It, it's one of the few environments, I, I think, where I found that, that people really do work and play well together. They really do try. It, and it takes some discipline to get there. It does. I, I want to go back to something you said earlier. We were talking about doing $100 million in revenue, not just raising money, right? Actually making And you talked about this concept of depersonalizing the success and the failure. Can you go a little deeper on that? Uh, yeah. I, one of the things that, that even today, um, you know, we have this discussion amongst the senior leadership at BMT is we committed when we started the company to being a revenue-based uh, company and earning our reputation. So we had thought to folks at BMT, they'll tell you the number one thing that counts in the day-to-day is our reputation. And by that, that means that you tend to under-promise and over-deliver on everything you do, which means sometimes your revenue model is that askew with what people think you should be able to do. So I'm willing to take, you know, uh, I'm willing to take no profit. I hate losing money, but it happens sometimes. In order to discover the right way to work with somebody. And in particular with our government clients, it's kind of a maturity model where we know what the high bar is and the nirvana that people want to get to. And they say, yeah, I want that. It's like, that's great, but you're not ready for that. We need to start at a lower level with you, mature you know, want our relationship with you, but also mature the relationship of the people on it in the organization with one another when it comes to innovation and ensure that you're building a healthy um, platform that can actually do this. The, the cost of doing that sometimes is you tend to put uh, a lot more effort into those programs early on because it just, it takes a lot of hands on. Then, then it's, it's not like, um, I got a contract that says I had five bodies to do X. The, the contracts really say, um, your job is to produce Y. We don't care how you get there, but this is what you're supposed to do. Um, that, that means to do it correctly, you're going to have to try 10 things in order to feel confident about the three that you tell somebody, these three things are the things you have to do. And, and we know that because we tried these other things. Lots of people will look at those other, you know, the, the other seven is, is wasted effort, you know, money that was spent that didn't achieve anything. We've always looked at that and said, if, if you haven't failed at some things, you're really not learning at your capacity. And, and we really demand of ourselves and, and of others high capacity learning. Um, so it's like I'm back to, it, you can't get spun up about the failures. You know, I get spun up if, if we're not trying hard enough. At the same time, the successes are, and maybe it's just a personality thing, it's like another step to another step. That's great. We did this. Get me to the next one now. Um, because the next iteration, the the trials and the pilots are more expensive. They're bigger. They're harder impact. But but you really want to get to that top one percent of the problems out there that that actually consume your entire being to work on. That's where we want to be. But we understand we have to earn our way to to get to that point. If someone is struggling to because maybe we've over identified with our business where we think. You know, we have, we have trouble separating ourselves from the business. So if the business isn't doing as well, then, then we're a failure, you know, or people like, you know, it's pretty classic for CEOs to over-identify with the business. Um, yeah. And uh, 
And so do you have any tips for the rest of us to, to depersonalize our own successes or failures? You want to present the face of the business and you want the business to be successful and other things at the same time. Um, it comes with a little bit of hubris is you have to realize that, that if you don't keep up and if you don't look at yourself with a critical eye, sometimes with the help of advisors and other people, if you ignore advice or if you, well, if you ignore the weak signals that something else is happening, um, because you can blinders on, you are going to get blindsided and you will eventually diminish, um, both yourself and the company in the process. And I, you know, I had this conversation. I'm thankful for my relationship with Steve Blank and several other people. You see, Steve will absolutely tell me the God's honest truth as he sees it when it comes to my company. And, and a lot of times it's brutal. <laughs> it, and some days it starts with, I don't understand why you just don't. And then there'll be a long stream of things to come after that. Um, that's hard to take sometimes, but I tell you what, it's the hardest thing in the world to get as a CEO of a company is somebody to give you the truth or to give you feedback that may be really hard for you to take. It's even harder for people to um, accept it. I didn't say not just accept it, actually seek it out. So in other words, I, I tend to listen to platitudes and other things that people give me and say, you know, that's interesting, but, but I, I, I want, I want to know what we're not doing well, what we could do better or what the other observations are. I think there's so many entrepreneurs out there, um, their first, I don't say their failure. The first failure is, um, not finding an avenue or a venue to get really hard, honest feedback. The second failure is either completely accepting that feedback with no analysis or ignoring it and trying to defend your preconceived position of what you're going to do. Those are really hard things for people to do. If we have a lot of our uh, self-image tied up in the company, there can be a lot of self-deception yeah. of not wanting to find out there's a problem, right? No, yeah, absolutely. I, I think the, because I don't want to say everybody's busy. You know, you take a ton of stuff on and you're driving forward and you feel like every time somebody raises a problem, raises an issue, it's like driving you back. Um, and it's, it's one of those things is it's the, or, or you're getting feedback from some places, Hey, you guys aren't doing this, or there's somebody else doing better than you, or there's something over here. And if you're not careful, you can be completely distracted by the noise and, and you can find yourself, um, chasing, um, Twitter likes and LinkedIn things and, and other things rather than focusing on the core thing that you're actually supposed to do. So then I, I spent a lot of time, you know, talking to, to folks in the company, particularly about what that phenomenon is not getting caught up in, in, in somebody else's band and what else they're doing is you focus on what you do well you know, and focus on, on building the ecosystem around your thing. thing. It, it, you will be successful. Um, you know, it, it, we've always pursued what I would say is, um, <laughs> Steve, Mike, I'll tell you, we suck at marketing. We don't market. Uh, we've always focused on getting the, the thought leadership level of, we want to think deeply and we want to share what we learn about what we do with the ecosystem, because I realized that if we don't democratize what we do, we will never get to that 1% pinnacle because we're constantly doing stuff at the lower level. Um, so not, not allowing yourself to get caught up in the, um, the white noise and the other stuff of uh, particularly the innovation business, um, is important. However, um, you can't cut yourself off from looking for the signs that things really have changed and that you have missed something. So it's a really delicate balance to make. You think about like the things that really matter. We've talked about, about on this call, the idea of like having a profitable business. I mean, with a lot of venture capital dollars drying up right now in 2022, there's a lot of VCs that are, that are talking to portfolio companies about like, hey, that path to profitability is going to need to be accelerated because the, the spigot is getting turned off, right? And, and so for, for so many folks, that, that thing changes to sales and marketing. We got we to hawk our stuff harder, right? And with you and the thought leadership and, and that positioning, getting positioned, 
as the high level people that know, like these high profile people in the field, I mean, it's kind of like marketing, like I'd call it credibility marketing, right? Instead of. But it, it is. It, it, and actually, you know, I had this conversation with, with somebody this morning. Um, they were asking me if it was responsible for BD in a company. And I said, all of us. Um, and I wasn't, I, I never had a BD team. I still don't have a team. I have somebody who's responsible for business development. Um, but I, I even have people who wanted to come to the company, coming out of government services, think, you know, I really, I want to do all this stuff. I'm just not interested in selling. Um, my answer to them is if, if you can't internalize what this company does and what it means to you, and you can't articulate that to somebody else and why they should want to, you know, be able to, why would you be here? And they said, no, no, that's not what I mean. I don't want to do in charge of video. So like, um, that, that's marketing, that's beating, that, that, that's the way we do this. If, if you can't embody what's great about your company and present that and articulate it in a reasonable fashion to other people, why the hell would they want to work with you? Um, so I, it, it's just in, in, incredibly important that people get to that point. I, I think the, it, it's dangerous sometimes, particularly for smaller companies to get stuck on their, um, the talking points. Um, and not be able to personalize what they're doing. Yeah, you know, particularly, I would say, in the professional services arena, because you really have to be able to reflect to the clients what it is they're trying to do. So discovery, all that work that you have to do to, to understand things, it's really important to, that you can reflect what you think the environment looks like, not what you want it to look like three years from now. So I want to double down on this. Thinking about this idea of, you know, and again, totally applies to this idea of, of some CEOs, some founders, leaders trying to get their company over the billion dollars, right, Mark? Um, this idea of credibility marketing, like doing the kind of thought leadership that is so good, it leads to work. And, and ideally, you know, the top 1% work in, in the field, right? Yep. What are the things that you have found the best? Speaking at conferences, writing books, writing articles, like what, what does that thought leadership f look like form-wise for you guys? You know, at the very lowest level, um, and I use LinkedIn for example, because, you know, I, I spent a lot of time publishing the things on LinkedIn. It, it is at the simplest level is providing thoughtful feedback to the things that you would hit like on. Give me an example. Now, yeah. and this one, you know, so, so I talk about, um, when we work with a client, we always talk about um, mapping the environment is who are the supporters, who are the advocates, who are the saboteurs, and the other things. And the example I use is when you read something on LinkedIn and you click like, um, it takes absolutely zero effort on your part. In fact, if there was an article or something, there's no telling whether you actually read anything. I just like this person. I do it. Um, that's different than um, leaving a comment, which means you actually thought about something. And that's different than sharing that post on your profile with your thoughtful analysis of right or wrong about it. And those are kind of the three levels of doing it. So, so at the most basic level, you know, thought leadership is put yourself out there. You have an opinion, you can defend your opinion, you can take questions and provide things for people to think. So it'd be part of the economy of thought, um, not just uh, a consumer of, of the stuff that people provide to you. Um, that migrates to the point of whether you're blogging or something else, but actually getting to the point where you can write um, in in short, uh, <laughs> it capture a thought stream and break it up so that it's not 10 pages long. And that is different from actually being published. Um, and I and I will say I've, I've taken the, the stream, you know, I was fortunate to have to do a writing, a lot of writing on an military. Um, we started out on the early days of simply, you know, usually social media and, and writing about the things that we did and learned and just sharing openly. You know, when people questioned us, they said, well, you know, aren't you giving away your IP? And it's like, I, I can't tell you if an original thought to me is an original thought or not. It was original to me and I can make it sound original because of the way I applied or got it. But that doesn't mean it's the first time somebody ever had this idea. And in fact, 99% of the time, it came from somebody 50 years ago who'd already written about it. 
Um, but you can use your analysis of something to drive a conversation that will teach you things, um, will identify people that you want to talk to, and will help you um, guide the direction you potentially might want to take your company or take a bunch of technology or do something else. Um, the, the harder level is, is really getting down to the point of, um, I'd say editorializing. It, it is, you know, getting yourself, you know, for instance, they published in Harvard Business Review, Wall Street Journal, Defense One, or a host of other places. And I don't do it, for, you know, it's not every week I'm turning something out. It's when something really gets to me and I have a statement to make, then I'll make it and I'll make it publicly and I'll, I'll drive a stake on the ground with my reputation and say, this is what I believe because of what I've experienced and what I do and what I see. Feel free to disagree with me. Um, it's in that disagreement that you actually learn things. Is that people will come back to you and say, well, that was great. Or, well, I don't agree with you because of what other things. But it's an opportunity to learn by pulling back from people. It's interesting what that signaling does, though. By having an opinion, you know, again, by you not just putting out fluff because it's Friday, right? But like, Picking the stuff that you, like you said, you can defend, you, you're willing to draw your line in the sand on, um, how much more likely that is that the bigger outlets would want to have something like that because you're not just putting out something to put something out. You know, that meaningness is going to ring through, right? Yeah, I mean, it, 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 takes, it takes a lot of And I almost just say that we hired a publicist before we hired a people to do marketing. Um, we hired a publicist before we even had a website. That we were that serious about capturing the thought, it, and, and at some point we learned that we were learn. We still do. We we learn so much on any given day. It drives me crazy that that it takes us so long to to capsulize some of it and put it out and get, catch ourselves coming or going. Um, but if you build that into a process and you actually put it out there, um, people will start to feed off it, and and if they're feeding off it. That's the really worst place. It, and I said, there's a one more Steve Blake story. But then I realized that every time I had a long conversation with Steve, he tended to learn things. He was learning more from me than I was from him. And it was an unfair conversation because he would always, because he had all his experience, then he'd take off to the next level. And what happened? Um, you want to you wanna create that kind of environment where, where you're helping other people elevate their game and at the same point using the dialogue to elevate your own game. It's, it, I think it's critical. I'll ask a somewhat selfish question here. Uh, why do you take the time to come on shows like this? I, I can guess on it, but what's your opinions of, you know, podcasts and video shows and stuff like this? Um, because you have really good questions. Um, it's an opportunity to think out loud. And, and quite frankly, I, I write better. After I've had a conversation like this, because I've, I've had to articulate, and you'll watch um, for every podcast we do, um, we'll take the transcript and turn it into a blog post. And then weeks later, uh, some of that will get incorporated into other things of writing. So I, I just, for me, you know, it's one is a way to get back because I, I think that, you know, you guys do such a tremendous job of these that um, I, I want to help you know, where I can, it is the opportunity to think and be asked questions that, that haven't been written down in front of me that don't have a script to answer. And I quite likely it, it's that opportunity to listen to myself later and say, okay, um, some of these things actually made sense but, and others it just doesn't. I'll tell you, sitting on this side of the camera, it's actually the hugest benefit to me. Like, I think like, what would Steve Blank cost me per hour if I was calling him for advice? You know, if I wanted his consulting hours, it, it wouldn't be cheap, right? And you, you, you can't do it. <laughs> if it was available. Steve Blank, right? Steve, Steve Blank doesn't work for money anymore. Right? Um, but, and I'm going to say, if he cared about what you were doing and he felt you were listening and would do something with what he gave you, he would talk to you for hours. Sure. He, he's a super he generous guy. You have to listen and you have to take action. It, it, so, so listen to anybody out there who's got a mentor. If you don't do those three things with your mentors, they're going to quit on you. And I don't care if it's deep like me or anybody else. If those three things count more than money. 
I actually feel like that is so important. I want you to repeat it. Will you say those three one more time? First, they have to care about what you're doing. And that's truly the most critical is, is if you're offering somebody money, they may or may not really care about what you're doing. Um, you have to actually listen and participate in the conversation. And then you have to take action with what you learned. And sometimes taking action means, um, in my case, to Steve, is Steve, I disagree with you. That's quite wrong. Or Steve, I thought about three things, but there's some things I think you're missing here. Here's this other dialogue. Um, and he and I, you know, I don't know whether it's Sunday. It, it's almost every week that he and I have an hour or two hour conversation about something that's stuck in one of our heads. And that turns into a bunch of, I've got a dry erase board full of stuff that I woke up this morning in my head. I snap a picture of that, send that to Steve and say, here's, you know, when we get back together, I want to cover. Yeah. Um, that's, that's a relationship you want with a mentor. If, if you're paying for somebody to give you that, like an advisor or something like that, it's a different relationship. And I'm not saying advisors are bad to be paid, um, but, but there is a way of recruiting and actually engaging them that is actually useful to you. Um, I found that, that particularly people of my age, and, and I turned 60 here in you know, another month, um, are more giving their time for free simply because they want to be engaged and they want to do things with people and they want to help. Um, so there's just tons of um, potential energy out there. And, and to your point, after I had Steve on the show for the first time, he set up a whole extra call with me where he let me tell him what I was doing with my real estate, commercial real estate fund, which I kind of a fintech brand. And gave me this great advice and it totally blew up her business. I had called my partners and we had, if we started everything over, you know, um, and it really came down to Jess, I think you've got something here, but I don't think you've listened to your audience enough. <laughs> you know, you need to go back and do the real customer discovery, not just, not just the surface level you've done. You know? And we had to get honest and go like, yep, you know what? This makes sense to us based on having previously run investment funds and it's way too complicated. And we ended up scrapping our entire structure after that call, you know, but for me, like, I feel like I get the credibility marketing of week after week after week, I get to talk to all these different kinds of people built hundred million dollar companies or set the world record for this or VCs or New York Times bestselling authors. And I get the free consulting, but, um, it also forces me, like you said, to think about what got said and then think like, Am I living that? Where does that apply? And uh, hopefully it helps I, I think that's, change me. Uh, that, uh, you know, people ask me, you know, why I teach Hack Me for Defense. You know, what do I get out of it? Because uh, I teach, you know, we said all of us that teach at Stanford teach for free. Um, I learned more yeah. in, in that 10-week course, listening and watching students go through the process and coaching and mentoring this process than, than I do anywhere else about the, how the innovation ecosystem and, and the, the operating entrepreneurship. I, I learned more in that process than I could in months, simply because I'm engaged with them for a purpose. And I think that's the beauty of you know, the work you're doing, Jess, that, that I think lends it back to you know, the rest of us. So maybe just to tie a bow in this one, for people that don't understand how writing LinkedIn articles uh, and, and getting in the Wall Street Journal, Harvard Business Review turns into $100 million of revenue. Can you, put, can you kind of put a point on it for them? So come back to, yeah, earning $100 million is, is a lot of hard work. It's just hard, particularly off, and I say earning $100 million. It's not getting somebody to give you money. It means you have to be smart about a lot of things. One is you have to be smart about how you manage your money. You have to be smart about the investments you make. You have to make hard decisions about the people you hire. Um, you have to be great at leadership of building a team and and sticking with people sometimes to allow them to grow. At the same time, you have to be really good about um, cutting people loose who are not a good fit. You know, there's a delicate balance between the two of, of you know, who, who is the core of your team even though they may be struggling with something, you, you tend to hold on to it. Um, I, I think the, my experience um, is that staying away from 
the, what I call it, the white noise of the innovation case of gotten everybody is standing up an innovation company to do things and focusing on, you know, I, I dislike the word innovation. We really deliver mission acceleration. Um, and I really, I really think it's, you know, innovation is merely a cultural process that leads to mission acceleration. We're about the cultural process. Yeah, and I don't care what the, I don't care whether design thinking, Scrum, uh, H4D, H4X, uh, or any other system out there. What we're really good at is taking the best parts of all of them and combining them in the moment to get the client to where they need to be to actually accelerate what they're doing. And sometimes that means um, collecting the, the collective thought from a lot of different clients and putting it out there for people to see. Sometimes it means talking to members of Congress about what needs to change in the next NDAA to free up the thought space or the, the physical space for somebody to do things. It, you tend to engage the entire system in order to make sure that that operating system actually functions. How you get revenue from that? You got to figure out how to get paid, uh, which means you have to have um, contract vehicles. You have to have a great relationship with your banker. You have to have um, people who are um, rewarded very well for what they do, but are also motivated by the growth of the company right? and are willing to sacrifice one for the other at the right time and right place. All that stuff comes into play at the same time. You know, there's there's so many messages in that. Uh, and But I think part of it is is... You know, you talk about that influencing of the client, right? Being able to talk to the senior government officials in your in your case is by being that thought leader, you you get access to those people. You know what I mean? Like no amount of pay-per-click ads, no amount of sales calls typically produces that, that type of positioning, that type of standing within an industry to be able to have that direct relationship with folks at the top, regardless of the industry, right? They, they want to meet with a peer. They want to meet, meet with somebody who's got something to bring to the table. And they don't have an hour to figure out if you have that or not. They're waiting for the rest of the community to signal, is this the kind of person that's worth my time to talk to, right? Yeah, absolutely. And I, I think in many cases, you know, so they don't have time to wait for the staff to tell them who the right people are to, to, to get a panel of folks together. I mean, I... I found myself, you know, on the phone with, you know, the future SOCOM commander on a Friday night at, at 10 o'clock at night, having an hour and a half conversation about uh, a variety of things. Or, you know, on a Sunday afternoon with the chief of naval research or, you know, early on a Monday morning with folks in the unmanned task force or, um, none of those conversations about doing BD, it's about helping them think through the issues they have, um, um and pulling on my network. Um, even outside the scope of contracts and others, to get them the help they need to get them the answers, whether I'm it or not. I think that's the that's the reputation builder. We'll we'll get to the point where we make money doing things, but that's never the first thing in mind when when I have an engagement with somebody at a level. I really want to understand the problem and help them with the problem first. The business will take care of itself eventually. Yeah, uh, there's this guy, the first guy to ever build an online music store long before Apple did it. It's this guy named Derek Sivers, okay? And oh yeah, do yeah, you know him? Yeah. TED Talks and stuff. Yeah, I, I have. Yeah, uh, it's interesting yeah. when he talks about this idea of like, if you can provide genuine service, you don't have to worry about money because money is a byproduct of service. He says, in fact, it's almost like yep. a, it's almost like a barometer to know if you provided an, a really helpful essential service because if you're not getting paid for it. It means it was like a nice to. It means these other things. It means that they would be fine losing it, right? But when people can't afford to be without it, they're yep. more than happy to part with the money to get it. Anyways, I thought it was an interesting thing of like, think care first, think helpfulness first, think loving your client, think, think, think about them first, um, but genuinely, in, instead of this attitude of like, what do I have to do for you to get the money? The kind of this reverse thing of like, if I do the right thing for you, well, I don't yeah, have to how do I make it money. easy for yeah. you? Yeah. Uh, no, I, and I think that's it's dead on. I, I think the um, even when I talk about you know BMT is a byproduct, BMT the company 
was a necessary um, step in actually getting to do the work we want to do. I collect really brilliant, motivated people who want to work in the national security space and make the world a safer place. In order to do that, they have to be able to earn a living. In order to do that, I have to be able to get money from people to do it. And to do that, I got to have a company. Um, when, when all this works, then, then the money takes care of itself. But as you said, the metric and the only one that I ever look for is tell me the revenue. Tell me how much money you actually earn. I don't want to have you. What you got venture capital folks to give to you. I don't want to about clicks and likes and other things at the end of the day. Show me what your company's revenue was at the end of the year and at the end of two years and at the end of five years. That's, that's the, the hardest metric to, to actually judge by. Listen, we covered a bunch of different subjects. Uh, what didn't I ask about? What do you want to talk about we haven't covered? You know, Steve and I, you know, for the last several years have held this, uh, what we call the innovators offsite for government folks and called the Red Queen Conference. Yeah, every year, you know, what started was Steve and I separately found that we were having similar conversations with people all over the place. And, and the conversations were repetitive. Um, innovation's hard because of this. You're not doing this. You don't do this. So we finally just said, what if we got everybody in the same room? And, and we sparked that conversation and let them self-actualize and talk to each other and did things. So we ran uh, Red Queen 1, I think, in 2017. And it really was... It laid out our understanding of what the innovation pipeline looked like. And then we ran Red Queen 2 and said, there's a way to discipline this process. Said, how do you look at the metrics for, for innovation and say, are you really doing anything or are you just making noise? Are you just a heroic organization out in left field? Or are you actually pulling through things, you know, deliberately trying to do something? Um, we ran one last month, you know, for the third time after a two-year hiatus because of COVID. And the thing that we settled on is is the struggle within the government is largely because um, innovation is there's no doctrine, there's no rules, there's no terms. Um, there's people say I want culture, but there's no job that you go to to learn how to be an entrepreneur. And the, there's not a profession, there's not a series of professional schools in in the government that teaches you how to do that. Nor is there a system that supports you once you have. So what happens is these people who are good at it, they quit. And they leave the government drawn in, in droves and, and go to the civilian environment. So I go back to uh, you know my, my infantry days and say, doctrine drove everything. I'm an instrument. There was a doctrine for the use of infantry in, in combat. And that doctrine permeated from one formation all the way down to the smallest fire team that said, you got a team leader, you got two riflemen or an automatic rifleman and a grenadier, and that's the formation. Um, what doctrine does is it gives you the common reference for the operating system so that people understand whose whose job it is to do what and what the output of innovation is supposed to be and how do we resource it and do other things. And that that quite frankly is missing. I think um Crossing my fingers, you'll see the Transportation Security Administration actually uh, a series of pubs this month and next month that talks about the for TSA and actually their own uh, innovation document. The first organization I've seen actually write a document that says this is how innovation works and this is what we're going to do. Um, yeah, and codified it in policy. But that's the full out of document is it has to be supported by policy and race and other things that, that defines what it's going to do. So, um, that's the problem that, that Steve and I are beating. So how do you get the army to, well, to write an innovation doctor? So we invited a whole bunch of people to Steve's ranch. Um, we had folks from the army, Navy, Air Force, uh, Homeland Security, um, CIA, NSA, DARPA, uh, yeah, so, uh, and and they left the droves with about this concept of what an innovation doctrine should and should not do. Um, and, and people, you actually hear people mention it now, so, you know, we have to do this. I, I think you even saw that, you know, the chairman and joint chiefs of staff say that the Pentagon needs a whole reset on innovation because they're just not doing it. They, 
Steve and I, Steve and I, that's believe, encouraging. Uh, the Pentagon is due for a real. Not a uh, reformation. Now, they tend the far on the acquisition system built in the, and, and a force management system that was built in the 70s and 80s and tried to apply in an environment where the clock speed is a thousand times as fast. So I'd like in a, to, 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 I'll date myself. My first computer was a Commodore 64. I'd like in it to take on a Commodore 64 and try and from this meeting on it today. It doesn't work. And it's not that it wasn't valuable. It is, it's, it's we need two systems that sit alongside of each other and could talk to one another. Um, one that does long acquisition things at scale, and one that is responsive at the speed and scale that it needs to be based on the rapidly changing world we find ourselves in. There needs to be another doctrine out there, and we need to push the button and make that happen. Well, I appreciate you making so much time for us today. This is really valuable information.